And what a great introduction to our opening keynote, Autonomous Ship and Shipping, the big picture. I actually do not think we could have a better introduction and stimulus for our opening keynote speaker, Jan Hoffman, Chief Trade Logistics Branch, Division on Technology and Logistics, UNCTAD, which implements multilateral transport and trade facilitation capacity building programs. More importantly, he is co-author and coordinator of the annual and much appreciated UNCTAD review of maritime transport. Mr. Hoffman will give us the bigger and wider picture for autonomous ships and shipping. Mr. Hoffman, please. Yes, a wonderful good morning from Geneva. Very happy to join this really very important and timely event. Uh, as you mentioned, we produce our annual review of maritime transport and I believe um, my slides have been shared with you. So I should now be able to have access and click on like next slide to share the insights from our review. There it is. And if I now click <clears throat> next, no, that is Magda, that is Jan, there is a Jan Hoffmann. So if I now click next, we tested it, there it is, good. I will speak to you about trends in global shipping and ports based on insights from our review of maritime transport. Our review uh, is UNCTAD's oldest flagship publications, um, 52 years anniversary already. Um, it's the second most downloaded publication, the best evaluated, and I think we can be quite proud of it. My presentation will be based on this year's review, but also benefit from the long time series and experience and data we could gather over the decades from our review. The review has actually five chapters um, for this presentation. I will focus more on chronological developments. I am clicking next. I hope it does work. I am shouldn't click too often because it may take 30 seconds to click to the next one. It is activated, there it is. So chronologically, it will be BC, DC and AC before Corona, during Corona and after Corona. And we will start with the long-term trends before Corona. There it is. Thank you, Jan, for my patience that it, I have to click like always 20 seconds in advance. Um, I will focus on three long-term trends before I then go to through during Corona and then some future long-term trends. A key long-term trend is on the demand side. If you look at the seaborne trade, the demand and the share of developing countries, you can really see a big change in the geography of trade. In 1970, developing countries had a trade surplus in tons. They were exporting high volumes of raw materials and low volumes of high, vo high value imports. Today, developing countries participate in globalized production, importing large volumes of raw materials and inputs. So this is really hard data on port traffic so the red are the basically the exports, the blue, the imports in volumes. And I think it very nicely illustrates this year, after year after year, the share of the South has changed, has increased. And today we have this yeah, globalized production. The second trend I want to mention here is on the supply side, or what we would call the connectivity and divide. Um, we have developed an index on liner shipping connectivity. Here we have the top five ports. You just see how they are increasing. They're actually all five in Asia. If you look at some less well-connected country, especially the SITS, the so-called small island developing states, almost all of them 
look like here the horizontal line. I've only put some examples here. Practically all except three, Mauritius, Jamaica, and Bahamas, are stuck in a, in a vicious circle where you don't have connectivity, then you are not competitive, then you don't gain the trade volumes. And if you don't have the trade volumes, ships don't come. And in the context with my next trend, with the economies of scale, the bigger ships, this is unfortunately bad news for the least connected countries. Uh, the index is generated from different components, again, hard data, not opinions or perception index or whatever. It is the vessel sizes, the total deployed capacity. And, and you see really here in these averages per country, index averages per country, ship sizes go up, total deployed capacity goes up, but the network components, especially the number of companies go down. Um, mergers, acquisitions, so it's two sides of the same coin. If you still have enough competition and choice for the shipper, then this is overall a good trend. You do have more deployed capacity and economies of scale. For the smallest player, this is not so good news. And if to this you add the aspect of alliances, um, ports are also confronted with an oligopsom like fewer clients and less negotiating power. So these were three long-term trends I thought you would find interesting on the demand side, supply and the industry. Let me go through what's happening during Corona. And there again, our review has 160 pages. There's a lot of analysis there, case studies. I had to make some selection. So on the um, uh, COVID disruption, uh, we highlight shock waves that go through supply chains, shipping and ports. You can see uh, the quarterly data here for different vessel types. First quarter, the dark blue, you see some vessel types still had an improvement over the previous year. Uh, and G carriers at 8.1% more port calls in the first quarter 2020 than in the first quarter 2019. In the second quarter, already all vessel types uh, had a strong decline, especially those that also move passengers like row on row offs and passenger ships, which are not on this chart, but very clearly the, the challenge is with the passengers. Now, while we were writing our review and we looked at the tremendous downturn in economic growth, we started developing our forecast. We read the news about what other forecasts and it looked really, really bad. In our earlier drafts, we had um, a projection that this year's seaborne trade would go down by 8%, maybe 11%. And now our published projection is minus 4.1%. The interesting story is, however, really how this projection changed while we were working on it. This is how it looks like. The red line is the seaborne trade growth the, the, and the blue, the economic growth or decline. Um, so here you have the 2020 projection. We published, we generated about a month ago. If you look at the very latest data, not only by us, but also by others, we actually already again have to update our projection. Clarkson's now with more recent data says only minus 3.6%. Now, the interesting news is not so much why did it decline, but more why did it not decline more? And I have th four points here that I think explain this. First, the decline is really in services. So the old GDP to trade ratio of the past has, has changed. It's not the goods trade that goes down. It is the restaurants, the travel, the Uber, the hairdressers that, that go down. Second, companies have increased their inventories. That's a short-term effect, but that also has to let some increase. Um, and, and really the, the very recent talking about the increase, uh, you may have seen just now there are record high freight rates from Asia to the Mediterranean. There are profits on the shipping company side. There are some routes that have a significant increase from the previous year, not just because of the inventories, but also because yeah, generally these, these four reasons. The, the third reason, the, the maritime industry responded successfully to the changes. The, while 
trucks may have been stuck at the border because the truck drivers didn't have their tests done. Air cargo suffered from the downturn in passenger planes because a lot of cargo spaces in the belly of passenger planes. So Maritime actually responded quite successfully. Um, and some segments record an increase in demand as people in lockdown buy more stuff. What do you and I do when we are at home? Like I'm here working from my home office. We buy stuff. And as I said, there are some segments that actually saw an increase. There's one group of people or one aspect that did not benefit or, or this is not successful, which is the seafarers. They are often stuck on the ship. They cannot leave because of this very complex challenges related to the crewing changes. It's not just enough to find a port where a crew can leave the ship. You need to make sure that the replacement arrives in time. You need collaboration between the, the industry, the ports, the shipping companies, the immigration authorities, the airlines. It's a long complex issue and we should please not forget the seafarers in this humanitarian crisis. So that was some thoughts on what's happening during Corona. And now I will focus on long-term perspectives. I will highlight two long-term perspectives. In our review, we focus on six really new normal, next normal issues, the trade, the economy, digitalization, data monitoring, resilience, and climate change. For this, and, and also after the introduction of, of Paul, I think, well, we discussed it before, let me focus on digitalization and on climate change. Who leads the IT reforms in your company? The CEO, the chief technical officer, or is it COVID-19? Very often it's COVID-19. <laughs> um, in UNCTAD, we developed a 10-point action plan, a policy brief that goes along the supply chain, the ship, the port, the leaving the port, crossing the country, crossing borders, regulatory framework, and so on. A lot of this is on digitalization. And without going through all the details, I want to highlight one key point that whenever you see a PowerPoint presentation, somebody talks about a trade of all balance, and I hope nobody of my fellow speakers will use this picture, you can still delete it now. Um, it's the wrong picture. All the concrete measures that we propose, be it in our policy brief or that are in the WTO trade facilitation agreement or the World Customs Organization in Brussels, they all help achieve both. They facilitate transport and trade and they protect the population from COVID-19 and from other threats. You know? Take pre-arrival processing, risk management, single windows, um, e-payments, so many aspects really help achieve both. The negotiation, the ratification, implementation of conventions take time. We need to commit to whatever is the best future technological solution. Here I like to highlight that technological progress will never be as slow as today. Is it slow? No, it is not slow, it's very fast, but it will be even faster in the future. And as we are, as we speak, the International Maritime Organization is negotiating um, measures how to achieve the goal of decarbonizing shipping. I believe that negotiators can confidently be more ambitious because technological progress will facilitate the, the future and future will be easier to reduce emissions than today. Easier said than done, but from whatever we know about the past and we see how exponentially technology is advancing, I think this is correct in view of the challenge and the threat posed by climate change, which then leads me to this issue of negative externalities from shipping, noise, pollution, accidents, oil spills, congestion in ports, CO2 emissions. And I want to highlight, we do love shipping. We, we, shipping is the most energy efficient mode of transport. It contributes to many sustainable development goals. It, it's great, we love shipping, but there are some negative externalities. And if you take climate change, global warming, who is paying today for those externalities? coastal populations in Bangladesh, whose lands are flooded, or investors in the Bahamas, whose properties are devastated by more frequent hurricanes, farmers in Mali, whose crops fail, 
or here in Switzerland, the ski resorts left without snow. And who should pay? I have to click one more time. There it is. Sometimes it deactivates the who should pay. The polluter should pay. Now again, the, there it is. The polluter should pay, and the polluter should be given three options. Don't pollute. Like go slower, you clean fuel, clean up and help adapt, filter by flood walls, or compensate. Take the more well-known example, oil spills. We had cases, there's an oil pollution compensation fund in London. You try to avoid spill, oil spills. If something happens, you clean up the beaches. If it's too late, you compensate the uh, fishermen or the tourism industry who suffered. Um, Already in 1995, there was an IMO document introducing the concepts of internalization of externalities. And it stressed that the total costs will usually be minimized if each company, if the private sector, if the potential polluter can choose the cheapest mix of mechanisms herself. I'm proud this document of April 1995 was written by yours truly when I was working for the IMO in London. And I'm quite Proud. I, I think it was the first IMO document introducing this concept. Today, private sector is promoting such initiatives, a levy on CO2 by the Global Maritime Forum, ICS, they don't call it a levy, it's a contribution, but it's in the right direction. And we try to support this with our analysis in the review. For example, we assign, we show which ship type emits how much CO2 per ship uh, in total. Of course, now you can go, you could go into more detail if we had more space and time per ship per ton or per ship per ton mile uh, by vessel size. This is just really the big picture. The big picture also shows that the uh, fleet has grown faster than the emissions. So that is good news. Shipping has become more energy efficient or more emission efficient. Still, it is increasing. We must do more. And to this effect, if you look at the, um, you can assign the missions not only by ship type, but also to a country, for example, to the flag state, or to the trading partner, or to the geographical area. If a country here has more emissions than another, like Panama has more ships, so that doesn't mean that Panama is worse than uh, Russian Federation. You can also look per ship. Bermuda has more. Well, Bermuda has offshore cruise ships or Denmark, Germany, they have more container ships which emit more per ship than uh, say dry by carrier. We saw this earlier. But I think the point here really is it is possible to assign the emissions and to assign the responsibilities for reducing uh, emissions and for reducing the risk of further climate change. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Maybe there's time for questions or questions and discussion. Thank you very much for your time. Mr. Hoffman, thank you very much indeed. And, and you've kept a time perfectly. So uh, you are moderator's dream. Thank you very much indeed. I thought that was a fascinating presentation, really uh, very fascinating to, to listen to. Thank you.